Hey there, and welcome to That Bond Show, That Nerdy Site's newest show and the internet's number one James Bond rewatch show, hosted by two guys named Logan and Trevor. Probably. Join us as each week we dive through a new Bond movie from Dr. No to No Time to Die. I'm one of your hosts, Logan Wilkinson, and joining me, as always, is my Phoenix son, Trevor Starkey. Now that's what I call solar power. Hey, there we go. We've got the puns, you know what I mean? The great thing about the James Bond series is even if you forget to make a fun punny opening for the first eight movies, you still have 17 left. You still have so much, yeah, like there's still so much room uh, to make it into a habit here. Um, yes, we're talking all kinds of solar power today on this week's episode, which of course is going to be The Man with the Golden Gun, the ninth film in the series. Uh, which was released on December 19th of 1974. Um, Trevor, it's we're here, Man with the Golden Gun. Um, it's interesting because I think I was kind of, you know, looking at the movies as I do kind of weekly, daily, mm -hmm. hourly almost, and um, it's really interesting if you break them up into a lot of different kind of periods, whether it's like, you know, five moves at a time, 10 at a time, eight at a time. Um, but for the purposes of this conversation, I like looking at them in like eight movie blocks um, because basically from Dr. No to Live and Let Die is a pretty great run all the way through, I think. There's, you know, Diamond Death Forever is rough, but at least it's like kind of campy fun. You don't like Thunderball? I think Thunderball is fine. Um, but it's largely great movies, right? Three that I think are for sure great and from Rush with Love, Goldfinger, and Live and Let Die. Um, but this like next eight movie run, I think, is the roughest stretch of the Bond series. Um, starting with Man with the Golden Gun. Uh, and so I'm very, very excited to kind of see what we have in store for us. This is where the mediocrity, I think, kind of fills in, uh, potentially as seen in this movie. Um, but before we get to all of that, let's go through the cast and crew here. Um, we have Roger Moore coming back as James Bond for his second time in the role. Um, Christopher Lee, fantastic, as Francisco Scaramanga. Um, Britt Eklund is Mary Goodnight. Um, Maude Adams is Andrea Anders. Hervé Verchez, I even, I even did a pronunciation thing and I still think I got the last name wrong, um, as Knickknack. Clifton James as Sheriff J.W. Pepper. Richard Liu as High Fat, Sun Tuk O oh as Lieutenant Hip, and then here we go. The regulars, Lois Maxwell's Money Penny, Desmond Llewellyn as Q, coming back into the series again after taking Live and Let Die Off, and Bernard Lee as M, with The Man with the Golden Gun being directed by Guy Hamilton in his fourth and final directorial effort and third in a row. Um, I do briefly want to touch on guy hamilton a little bit uh because i teased it a little bit last week but what a strange weird output of movies he did for the series yep. in goldfinger diamonds are forever live and let die and man with the golden gun where arguably none of the four are the same or thematically similar really um they're all very different kinds of movies yeah it's i i was thinking about it when we talked about live and let die last week it's it's the uh, oh shoot, I forget his name now. Like I even looked it up during last week's show, but by the time like I was gonna come in with it, Frank Miller. It's the Frank mm. Miller effect of like mm. that's the guy who directed Babe, A Pick in the City, and Mad Max Fury Road. It's like yeah. wildly different films. Yeah. Um and I would say that that like Guy Hamilton has kind of a lot of that flavor to to his output here among these movies. It's interesting because I saw someone put out a ranking of like basically ranking bond directors uh and he got to guy hamilton was just like what a weird hard one to rate where he's got like two movies i the or the interviewer really loved right and then two that they didn't right which are the same for me goldfinger and love and let die diamonds are forever man with the golden gun and like trying to nail down where he would rank among like, the series directors is so hard because like Goldfinger alone, right? Just for like what it did in terms of setting that template, has to rate you so highly. And then he's got two movies that, um, you know, Diamonds of Forever is fun at least. Um, but 
Next up, going to Blast from the past section, we've got Gerald Ford as the newly sworn in president out here and Harold Wilson as the PM in the UK. Uh, the highest grossing movie in the US was Tower and Inferno, which I absolutely love. Uh, we're in the peak of B-movie heyday here. Those, um, those disaster films of, of the era. Yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely. It's like that, Poseidon Adventure. Yep. Poseidon Adventure was, I think, one, like, a couple years ago. It was in, like, the top two or three. Yeah, it were very much in that time period. Um, and, again, one of my favorite recurrent sections, the Boston Celtics won the NBA title yet again uh, for the 12th time overall. That's That's um, got to be stopping sometime soon, right? Because I feel like they have not won the title in my lifetime. I, I may be wrong will, on that. I'm, I'm looking them up right they've now. They've definitely but. won it in, the li- in your lifetime because they last won it in 08, Oh, did they? Okay. Um, basically, yeah, their last big like heyday oh, okay. was the eighties. Yeah, it was um, 08 and then nineteen eighty six before that. Yeah, with Larry Bird. Um, so we're gonna really they're really dominating so the, the first yeah. half of the series, and then they're gonna kind of fade away. They've um, taken it. They've taken it twice in my lifetime. Yeah, but it is one of my favorite recurring segments so far, and we're not done um, with, with them yet. Uh, and then in the What Were the Beatles Doing section, Paul McCartney and Wings were touring the world after the release of their landmark album, Band on the Run, um, which is released in December of 73. Um, so that's what the Beatles were doing. Um, otherwise, we've got the trivia section, which I, I think is a great week of trivia. Um, it's very messy. So Man with the Golden Gun, while not a box office bomb, was a massive disappointment for the Bond series, especially coming off the wake of Live and Let Die's success. Grossing at $97 million at the box office, it was the lowest grossing Bond movie since On Her Majesty's Secret Service, is the fourth lowest grossing movie in the series ever behind On Her Majesty's Secret Service, Dr. No, and For Much With Love, or I should say, ahead of. Um, and remains the last time a Bond movie failed to hit $100 million at the box office. Um, kind of tying into this and going back to what we were talking about last week, shortly after this movie and under a suffocating debt burden and creatively exhausted, Harry Saltzman sold his 50% stake in Dan Jack, the Holden Company for Ion and Bond, to United Artists. This is after a failed attempt to sell his stake to Paramount Pictures earlier in the year which is a great, like, through their looking glass, like, what if moment if it had gone to Paramount Pictures. Um, yeah, it would have been great. Uh, or not. Uh, the troubles didn't stop for Saltzman here to kind of wrap up his arc with the show. Um, he would go in default on his payments to Swiss Bank that we talked about last week and end up being ordered by a UK court to pay an additional 38000 in legal fees to an American law firm that he had recruited. Uh, by the end of the decade, he was basically all but retired from the film industry um, before going on to pass away in December of 94. Um, I didn't get too Real, deep in it. I, oh, so yeah, I, I wanted to highlight one that I saw in the trivia um, mm-hmm. on Saltzman, uh, where he wanted an elephant stampede yep. as yep. part of the movie. And uh, in in like researching that, they found out that, that, that the elephants would need special shoes made. And so he like contracted what like, 2,600 shoes to be made uh, and they obviously never used that scene or that idea for the movie uh, and basically he defaulted on payment to that guy and uh, what the trivia said basically as of 1990 that person still never got paid by Eon Productions it is yeah we did, I didn't get too much into it because I didn't want to be too much of a downer but his life post bond is actually really sad um I just it thought that just, one was such a funny yeah. and uh, obscure thing where I was like, okay, yep, this guy was just terrible with money. Yeah, yeah, his his failed kind of, or I guess successful, but then disastrous takeover of the kind of uh, company we talked about last week really just did him in, and he never kind of really recovered from that. Um, it's like the yeah, idea. So this, it's it's like the idea that gets broached in like Batman Begins of like, well, uh, we gotta mask the purchase, so we're gonna buy ten thousand shipments of this other mm-hmm. thing. Um, and uh, oh, they they were broken, so we need like we've put in another order. The like the the idea of ordering twenty six hundred elephant horseshoes or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> it is a weird um weird life that he lived post bond and really during bond too and i think it's interesting because we're going to talk pretty much exclusively about the broccoli family from this point on in the series and saltzman actually again it depends a little bit on who you ask obviously but most of the consensus is that saltzman actually had the idea of you know buying the bond rights first 
and then kind of contacted Broccoli is what most sources say. Um, and it almost felt like the minute he got it, he immediately was like interested in other things. He, you know, produced other films outside of Bond at a far more prolific rate than Cubby Broccoli ever did. Um, but once, you know, once they got into Bond, Broccoli went like all in on it and Saltzman, it was kind of never, never enough for him, uh, to calamitous, uh, effects, unfortunately. Um, yes. So, um, kind of tying into all of that drama, uh, in my opinion, in my humble opinion, as a Bond kind of fan and historian, there are four moments in the Bond series, uh, where its future was in legitimate question, um, for those who are wondering, I think those kind of time periods were after On Her Majesty's Secret Service. And that whole time period was a mess. Uh, one is right now and with Man in the Golden Gun. Another one is during the late 80s um, when they got into huge legal issues. And then one was post Pierce Brosnan where there was legitimate questions of it continuing on. Um, this and On Her Majesty's Secret Service are probably the two most grave instances. Um... Yeah, with the mixture of the poor box office reception, the terrible critical reception to Man with the Golden Gun, along with all the legal drama of Saltzman's stakes, because um, even after he sold them, it was a whole legal hullabaloo with that, uh, and him suing Broccoli and everything. Um, it would lead to kind of real uncertainty about the future of the Bond series, um, and all that kind of tied together would lead to the longest at the time gap in between Bond movies, three years, until The Spy Who Loved Me came out in 1977. And we'll dive a little bit more into it next week, but um, there was like serious question if that movie hadn't performed well, um, the Bond series almost certainly would have taken a longer break um, if Spire Love Me had not succeeded. Um, this is the third and to date last Bond film not to feature James Bond in the pre-credits sequence, although of course there is a model of Roger Moore's Bond in there as well. Um... Before acting, Christopher Lee worked briefly for the British Secret Service and learned several languages, Swedish among them, which he spoke while off camera with Maud Adams and Bert Eklund, or Britt Eklund, excuse me. Um, Christopher Lee was also, this is just the Christopher Lee happy hour now of trivia facts, because there are so many great Christopher Lee facts. Mm -hmm. um, Christopher Lee was also the cousin of Ian Fleming and the author's first choice to have played Dr. No. Um, continuing in Christopher Lee trivia facts, while on location in Thailand, Roger Moore found a cave full of bats. He couldn't resist seeking out Sir Christopher Lee, telling him what he had found in Jokin, Master, they're yours to command. Obviously a reference to Christopher Lee's time as Dracula. Um, in addition to that, while traveling to LA for The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson to promote this movie, Christopher Lee had his golden gun confiscated by U.S. Customs, um, which I just love. And there's an, as an extra little fact on top of that. Uh, there were three models of the golden gun made, um, only one, which you could kind of disassemble and reassemble. And according to Chris Riley, it was a pain in the ass to do. Um, although there is a scene of him doing it in the movie. So he managed to pull it off after enough, uh, time and effort. Really, there's no other better time to talk about it, I think, than right now. So I just kind of want to talk about the golden gun for a little bit. Mm -hmm. Um, what a cool iconic gun especially with what golden i did to it with like it's a one shot kill kind of thing yeah um that is completely ridiculous at the same time that was my um, my first note is the titular perfect. golden gun looks like shit like yeah. when, when you see it in its constructed form like yeah. and the first time we see it is like in that you know uh, uh uh raven's mouth or whatever um i was like well that just looks really really dumb uh, and then I, like I got a little bit more appreciation for it when it was like revealed, and I think I may have already also known this in in like just the back of my head through like pop culture that it was like a modular thing that can be like constructed out of mm -hmm. the cigarette case and a pen or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but yeah, it, like the the f like this is a thing that if made now would look a lot better, obviously. Yes. And, and like we've seen, I, I would say like in, in films, so many like better interpretations of this idea of like, mm -hmm. um, you know, taking the thing and turning it into a better looking weapon. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, it, it just, yeah, it just looked like yeah. weird and clunky with like the, the, you know, the bulkiness of the handle, I guess. Yeah. With the cigarette case. Yeah. It's interesting. Because as a kid, I had, like, as to sh the shock of no one, I had lots of Bond books and, like, behind-the-scenes ones. And so, like, they showed, 
there, right? Like it was like a in-universe Bond like book of like each movie, and so it was like, oh, like this is how Scaramanga made his gun kind of thing. It had like in-depth pictures, but while watching it, you get none of that, and you're just like, oh, that's a weird looking gun that Lazar made, and you don't even know that it can be like taken apart or put together again until he does it in the movie, and then it's like, all right, that explains some of it, but also there's not really a reason for him ever to disassemble it mm-hmm. and i also like the scene of chris Lee when he is uh going to kill um like the solex inventor mm-hmm. and like the you know back ellie holding the handgun like it's a rifle like aiming on the sights that close and it's like they just have no idea what they're doing with this gun and it's great it's fun uh but it is such a weird um it weapon and yeah it, i think it's a ton of fun and then i got such a great second life with golden island 64 obviously it's it is a it's a weapon that like feels designed for the scene of him killing high fat of him just very nonchalantly like putting it together and then like killing the guy um and then taking it back apart and all that stuff um and yeah for the rest of it they're like i think they have one other time where they have fun with it when um uh scaramanga meets bond on the islands basically like holds up like his his cigarette case and says I'm unarmed, and we, yeah. the audience, know what that cigarette case can yeah. be and can be turned into, um, but obviously Bond does not. And I think that's like, but they even that they don't really like play with or have any fun with. Nope. Uh, yeah, it's a it's a weird gun, but I just want to talk about it because it, it is probably the most iconic part of this movie. Um, the last little trivia fact here that I didn't include in the doc, uh, but I'd be remiss if I didn't mention it, is I a week or so ago went through and looked at like the a lot of stats of all these bomb movies to kind of collect for trivia facts uh, and one of them was the rotten tomato data on every movie and uh man with the golden gun has the second lowest rotten tomato score of any of the bond films um and the lowest of what we've seen so far coming in at a 39 uh, percent on rotten tomatoes to put that in context for the series as a whole um, the previous lowest was a 64 where the diamonds are forever. Wow. Is that, uh, is that the reviewer score or is that the audience score? That is the reviewer score. I didn't care okay. about the audience score at all. Okay. Um, then basically none of them are lower than like a 65. They're mm-hmm. all, you know, relatively well reviewed. Um, and as an extra little trivia effect on top of that, um, Roger Moore is going to have the lowest average Rotten Tomatoes score of any Bond, uh, coming in at an average Rotten Tomatoes critic score of 56.7, and, um, for more fun facts. And I, I, I just want to make sure that this mm-hmm. is, like, put in the appropriate context, because I'm pretty sure with Rotten yes. Tomatoes, like, that score means, like, only that percentage of reviewers recommend you see the movie, right? It's not, it's not like, oh, on average, this got a 4 out of 10, kind exactly. of score it's yeah from it's, my understanding as well yeah. yes that is correct okay um and we've already seen the bomb movie with the highest percentage which is goldfinger which came in at a 99 which is fucking nuts um it's a great movie though um so that is the trivia after that we've got the 070 second recap i did it earlier today i clocked in at about like 80 like 78 to 81 seconds i was gonna um, th- this looks like an 80 seconder for me that's what i was gonna guess it's funny because when I sat down to type out this week's recap, I was like, I feel like literally not a lot happened in this movie. Um, and so I just kind of, I, but you know, still came out to 80 seconds, um, having to kind of fluff it out a little bit. Let's do it though. Nick Knack hires a gunman to kill Scaramanga for a little fun. We see the fun house they have in the basement and Scaramanga dispatches the would-be killer. Bond, meanwhile, is told that a gold bullet with 007 was sent to him with Scaramanga's fingerprints on it and is pulled from his Solex mission. After traveling to Beirut, where he finds a gold bullet that had killed a prior 00, he then heads to Asia, where he meets specialty gunmaker Lazar, who then leads him to Andrea Anders, Scaramanga's mistress, who wants him dead. Bond meets High Fat as Scaramanga before being knocked out and sent to karate school. Lieutenant Hip and his nieces fight off the school and escape, while Bond takes the water out. Scaramanga kills High Fat for reasons. Bond meets with Anders and promises to kill Scaramanga in exchange for the Solex. Bond sleeps with Anders with Goodnight in the closet. Scaramanga kills Anders and leaves her body at a kickboxing match and talks with Bond. Bond gives the drop Solex to Hip, who gives it to Goodnight, who is captured by Scaramanga. A car chase ensues with Sheriff Pepper in tow. Bond does a great car jump with a bad slide whistle, and Scaramanga flies away. 
Finally, Bond goes to Scaramanga's island, gets in a duel, kills Scaramanga while disguised as himself, and leaves with Goodnight before stopping Knickknack's attempt to kill them on Scaramanga's boat. 78 seconds. I'm pretty happy with that. Yep. I'm pretty happy with that. I got everything I want to talk about in the movie in that recap. There you go. Um, Trevor, how many were killed? So, so I've got a few different ways to, to play this one out because there aren't a ton of kills in this movie. No. Um, yeah. so, uh, I have, um, I, I, I kind of want to quiz you on, uh, I, I will say just broadly, I will say this, the, the official count that I'm pulling from, uh, on mm-hmm. the, the all out of bubble gum, I, I know for a fact is wrong because they only say that there were six kills and there's at least one that I can think of. And and so my the thing I want to play is either um, how many kills does Scaramanga have, how many kills does Bond have, or mm. what's a missing kill from this list. And I in that in that instance, I would read out the full list of the kills that they have listed and and uh, and ask you to guess or or identify a kill that is missing. Yeah, I'm down. I'm, I mean, honestly, I want to do Bond and Scaramanga for sure. I want to do both of those. Okay. Um, so Bond, we'll start with, like you said, this is a really uh, casualty-free movie in a lot of ways, mainly because just obviously like the central dynamic between Bond and Scaramanga. Um, I don't think Bond kills... So, and again, we're doing named characters too, obviously, for this. Like, I don't think Bond kills a named character. <coughs> it It might literally only be... Scaramanga, right? Because he doesn't kill high fat. Scaramanga does. He doesn't kill the guard at the Scaramanga's like fortress. Good knight does. He doesn't kill Nick Knack. He's just a little like thing at the end. Um, he doesn't even like henchmen. I don't really know like Bond kills any henchmen. Like I, I think Bond's named kills is one, and it's Scaramanga. Mm-hmm. That's my first answer. That is correct. Um, perfect. Got this week's right. Scaramanga kills way more. He kills the dude at the beginning. Rodney. Uh, the little like, gunman from Diamonds Are Forever. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he kills um, High Fat. He kills the Solex Inventor. He kills his mistress. And I think that is it. So I'm going to say Scaramanga kills four people. Also correct. Yeah. Uh, Scaramanga shoots Rodney in the first duel, shoots Gibson, the, Gibson, the solar energy expert, mm-hmm. High Fat, and then Andrea. Yep. Perfect. Um, what's the list? Who's missing? So the the, the last kill that is listed is Goodnight pushing Craw into the liquid nitrogen. So so it misses Scaramanga. No, no, it's a Bond. You, you already said Bond kills Scaramanga. Oh, okay. So who is the who? Like, there's at least one more kill that I'm thinking of that happens in the movie, and it's not necessarily like I will say that this isn't named characters, but like usually this list will include like unnamed henchmen and stuff like that. And so what's what is one more? It for for me at least, it was an iconic elemental kill kind of Ooh. of the movie. Um, Just in it, I will I will give the hint of in its absurdity. Oh, okay. That's fun. So yeah, let's let's think. So it's get you said it has six listed, right? So we just did four for Scaramanga, one for Bond. So I'm still I guess and then one. and and Mary Goodnight's kill Mary on Goodnight's Craw is six, is yeah. the so six. Who who else died? So not High Fat. Um, Bond fights people at High Fat's place, but doesn't kill any of like the sumo wrestler dudes. Um, he doesn't kill any of the ninja people. I think um, no one dies in the car chase. No one dies in the boat chase. I think. Um, Ooh, this is a good one, Trevor. Okay. Um, I think I might not know the answer to this. So the one I'm thinking of, at least, and there may be more, but this is the one that like jumped to mind, is when Bond comes to in the karate school or whatever, they have the two kids dueling with swords, and one of them oh, just shit, like yeah. stabs the other like absolutely. through the chest, and that kid dies. That's absolutely right. Just yeah, straight up totally mm, accurate. Straight up kid murder fight. <laughs> Um, kid murder. Yeah, he totally kills the in, dude. You're right. Into all of the rest of the uh, the karate stuff. That <laughs> was just like, yep. okay, yep, this is weird. Yep, you were totally right on that. That is absolutely right. Yeah, he definitely gets fucking murdered hardcore. Yeah, the and the other like the other potentials that like they include in the unconfirmed and uncounted are like the fight in Beirut, um, in the belly dancers. But like they basically yeah. say like none of that looked like brutal or fatal. or fatal yeah. or anything like that the the closest would be like oh the guy who gets his head smashed into a mirror or something but I, yeah. we're not well i mean we're kind of at the recap now so we're just, i'm just gonna kind of start there that fight in like terms of like the overall movie 
there was not a good fight. <laughs> I mean, there, the, like, there were so many things when you were going through the recap, I was like, oh, right, that happened. Oh, right, that happened. Like, so yeah. much of this, and I watched this yesterday, like, so I much of this is too. just already forgettable. Um, yeah. Uh, and, like, and, and so much of it is, like, I want to forget it. It was like, mm-hmm. as you were kind of going through it, uh, I was like, oh yeah, that's right. Like your, your bit about um, what uh, Lieutenant hip and his nieces fight off the school and then escape while bond takes the rat- water out. I was like, oh, that's right. Yeah. The nieces get introduced. And then I'm like, well, that was a weird thing that needs to come back into play. And then when they come out and they okay. start like kicking everybody's ass, I was like, okay, well at least there's that. And then they just like leave bond behind as they flee. Yeah. I'm like, what the hell was that about? <laughs> Yeah. Oh, it's just because it they wanted leads, to do this other water sequence. Okay, sure. It also leads to the great water sequence where, like, Bond gets in that boat a clear 30 seconds for any of the bad guys. Instead of just putting the propeller in the water and driving off, does, like, the weird propeller blade thing and yeah. then puts it in right next to them. It's like, I don't, like, what was the point of any of that, right? Like, just wanted a cool shot of a propeller spinning fast, right? Yeah, and, with a weird, uh, that was another, like, there's a lot of racism stuff in this movie. And that one, like, yes. he, he even has, like, a weird, like, this is like a Mexican goodbye or something like some weird. I was like, I don't even like yeah. the way that's being delivered. I'm pretty not sure it's racist, standoff. but I've yeah. never heard of this being because yeah. th- it's not a Mexican standoff or yeah, anything, which right. has a other very distinct, uh, you know, con- connotation. It was just a weird like like a, a a weird kind of like introducing the idea of a Mexican something something um, while in Thailand. And like, what mm-hmm. <laughs> what is the what? <laughs> um, it. Yeah. So I think, I mean, like, tackling that head on, right? Like, do you understand? Do you have an appreciation for what I meant last week when I said Sheriff Pepper just goes full oh, yeah. board races? Like, he doesn't, yep. like, he, like, that's what I was like. Last week is pretty mild compared to what we're going to get here. Yeah. I think my, I think my fuck off Sheriff Pepper count mm-hmm. ended up at like five because yeah. basically anytime he did something that I was, I, like, I was pissed off by. Um, mm-hmm. I was like, oh fuck off, uh, and yeah. then I like it was like, oh double fuck off, oh triple fuck off, oh quadruple. Yeah, I think it, I, I think it actually ends at quadruple fuck off. Um, oh no, it, it would be five because I didn't write quintuple fuck off after Pepper gets one last in in parentheses, hopefully racist line in um, yeah. when like everybody's staring up at the car that, that is now flying right. away as a plane, kind yeah. of thing. So yeah, it, it, qu- quintuple got... fuck off to to that asshole. <laughs> He at least got knocked in the water by the elephant, which is great. He got some sort of comeuppance for and, being awful. And I was so, like, I knew it wasn't coming because, again, I'd already kind of, like, spoiled it for myself a little bit and knew that he was going to have some kind of direct interaction with Bond. But, yeah, when that when the elephant knocked him in the water, I was like, okay. Like, if it had ended there, it would have been like, a, oh, that's a, like, that's a weird kismet kind of thing that he's mm-hmm. there and also yeah still fuck him and so yeah he gets his comeuppance but then when he's miraculously in the car dealership that bond hijacks a car from later it's like mm-hmm. oh god damn it <laughs> it's so funny because whenever i think of this movie i for whatever reason always think of him in that beginning sequence with like the elephant and like the boat chase and so even here like i watch him like great there he is he's awful like usual and then like i always somehow like forget maybe because the rest of the movie's taken so much of my, my attention in other bad places that like i kind of lose track of him and so it is always that thing when he pops up in the car i'm like oh fuck right this is gonna be like they found a new way to ruin a cool car chase right um and yeah he's just there him talking on the radio to good night right like i've been deputized yeah uh it's just all not good the whole like the the introduction of the boat sequence yeah. in general, I was like, I, I almost had those Give same kind of, exactly. I had the same flashbacks <laughs> that I had after Thunderball in the next movie when they did like underwater filming. I was like, Oh no, not yeah. again. And okay. so, yeah, this time they introduced like, Oh, it's, it's going to be another boat chase. Not again. And then I appreciate that. Like the motor immediately craps out. I'm like, okay, thank God we're going to be saved from that. And then pepper shows up and then the kid like turns the motor on and I'm like, Oh no, they are doing another boat. <laughs> but like, it's not, extend it or whatever but it is like longer than it needs to be and and also like the one saving grace on that for me was like i was like why are they like what is the purpose of this kid who's continually trying to sell this elephant thing and then bond being like i'll pay you twenty thousand bot if you can if you can get mm-hmm. this boat to go faster and he turns the novel he's like twenty thousand bot please and then bond just throws the kid in the water i was like cool this is a bond i enjoy um it's funny this because this makes like this one sequence yeah. worth it 
um and for again as stupid as it is um yeah. i was like okay i appreciate that, that like that went a direction i was not expecting it to go yeah it's funny because i didn't talk about the trivia but like roger moore like doesn't like so much of this movie mm-hmm. um and like that I, kid scene in particular he doesn't like yeah he doesn't like the scene where he like is twists, friend is like twist break the arm and, yeah, of, like, and yeah, Anders, yeah. yeah and it's there's so much again when i talked a week ago and i've talked about roger moore like i think his first two movies here and last week with live and let die like he's playing a more serious ish bond for roger moore um and i think last week it struck a really good balance for me at least of like serious and comedic and very tongue-in-cheek and kind of sly and i i really liked that performance a lot and this one veers too much of just being like bond's just kind of an asshole right like this, it sort of has that thunderball tendency to be like you're just kind of a dick right now and like not getting the right balance yeah i mean my like my overall kind of thoughts on this very broadly mm-hmm. are like this has so many of the worst elements of the worst movies on the the list so far like yeah. so much of this yeah. is the like rampant unneeded racism of you only live twice mixed with like the you know the the travel log esque style or nature of you only live twice of like oh let's mm-hmm. let's show beautiful exotic thailand yeah. bangkok macau let's like let's let's do a you know a fluff travel piece on those while also just yeah having miscellaneous racism misogyny throughout the the movie in in like uncomfortable ways the um it has the um was oh that like all of the stuff with good night and anders yep. where like yep. bond just shoves good night in a closet is like yep. the the like worst elements of the playboy nature yep. of bond from um honor majesty's secret service um and then like and then of course the J Pepperness J W Pepperness of of the last one that is just like so agonizingly frustrating, like yeah. so many ele- like they just took all the wrong lessons from yeah. so many of those other yeah. movies and like just threw them all into this one and like Christopher Lee is like the saving grace for me yeah. from keeping this from being just an utterly abysmal experience and spoilers yeah. it's it's what keeps it from being the bottom of my list Ooh, um, really yeah I mean, oh, we are gonna disagree then because again okay. i i really do n- i i have zero interest in ever seeing thunderball again <laughs> because mm. i know that the last unle- unless i'm trying to fall asleep for that last half hour or whatever um like christopher lee at least like will save it a little bit from that nature mm. Um, and it's it it's just the most disappointing thing is I wish Christopher Lee were in a better movie because <laughs> mm, I yeah, think right. I think he's bringing like a ton of fun to this. There's also like there's also the the I guess I'll I'll call it like the Scarlett Johansson effect now of like he's playing like a a Cuban or whatever like you know the uh, or Puerto Rican I don't remember he's playing somewhere of like South American descent in Francisco Scaramanga um, uh, and it's very clearly like very white Christopher Lee kind of thing in a very heavy tan. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. uh, there, so there's like uncomfortable elements of that too, but at least like the performance he's trying to give is a ton of fun. But yeah, like mm-hmm. high fat, chew me, like so like mm-hmm. the 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 names are just like agonizing. The fact that I was seeing in the trivia, and again, this isn't something I, I would have just innately picked up on that film, but like in the trivia, the fact that the nieces are talking, like one of them's talking Thai, one of them's talking Chinese. It's like, wh- what's the, like, you? so you just went with like, say Asian things uh, yeah. was basically the direction. Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of like irksome elements. And then there are just like little moments of like, glimmer and and hope in this movie like mm-hmm. the the car stunt is really cool the slide whistle so cool absolutely stupid but also like yeah. in the moment i think i was more amused and amazed by like the practicality of the corkscrew like flip mm-hmm. that like it wasn't until i was reading through the trivia that that, that mentioned the, the slide whistle i was like oh yeah there was a slide whistle in that thing mm-hmm. and that's like like even that just falls into like the jw pepper effect of it all well, like the whole thing's played for laughs in a comedy kind of scene. So, um, you know, they're going to have J.W. Pepper fall in the back of the car or whatever. And that's what the slide whistle is. The The car flip is actually really cool. And I thought like they they do a really good job with it. 
Um, and and seeing the trivia behind that of like, yeah, they they bought that stunt and they basically like patented it or whatever, like a couple years in advance. So no other movies could try and take it um, before they could do this one. Um, I was like, OK, yep, yeah, they just went all nuts, like all out nuts mm-hmm. for that stunt. And then the fact that like they nailed it the first time, ta- the, like in the first take, I was like, cool, great job, stunt team. Yeah. Um, uh, so like that's like a glimmer of hope in that like second act of the movie. And then, like, I do, I really do enjoy a lot of the, like, anytime Bond and Scaramanga are, like, head-to-head, I think that's a great, yep. Um, yep. like, great, great sequences. Um, and I think, like, Scaramanga is an engaging threat that up until the, like, I've created a solar laser death ray kind of thing is, like, he's just an assassin for hire. Yeah. This isn't like about world ending stakes or anything like that. And yeah. I like I appreciated that. So like when it uh, like and I appreciate that he's just he's he gets a million dollars a hit. So he's got like a crazy funhouse lair yes. that ties into his backstory in a weird engaging way of like circus performer yeah. or whatever. Like he's an interesting character and Christopher Lee does a great job with it. He's just mm-hmm. surrounded by such a nonsensically stupid movie. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, so I agree with almost everything you said, right? Like, for me, spoiler alert to kind of the end of the show, like, Man with the Golden Gun is going to be my least favorite movie we've done so far. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it is just a bad movie pretty much all the way across. Um, like, it just, I think, almost no level works, except for Scaramanga, right? And, like, Roger Moore and Chris Lee, it shouldn't be shock. We're, like, already really close friends when they film this movie, right? So their chemistry is just so good together. I like the fact that, like, Roger Moore had always said he wanted to be a Bond villain and like he kind of gets to be one for like two minutes here when he's like playing Scaramanga and I just feel like he would have so much fun with the villain kind of role um he just eats it up uh yeah like I think they play with each other so well that entire last act in like Scaramanga's like little island retreat and the like the fun house stuff is all right I think the fun house um like whole set is one of my favorite Bond villain areas right and like hideouts it's such a cool weird um like location it's such got a great introduction in the opening of the movie um and like i think knickknack kind of having fun with that and i like the idea of knickknack hiring people to kill scaramanga both to like make scaramanga stay sharp right is like the thing mm-hmm. and then also if he does die i get everything right like it works out either way it's a win-win um and like both helping scare manga and hurting him at the same time like hiding the gun while also like navigating the you know gunman down like the alleyways and same for bond so like that all is really cool and i think that's all really unique i just think that those are like 10 to 15 minutes of the movie in a two hour and 10 minute movie right yeah. i think good night is awful like, i think that character <laughs> is truly terrible and it's not brit Eklund's fault at all. She is just given absolutely nothing to work with other than just like fawn over James for two hours. I was I was so amazed when they're at dinner and she's like, No, I don't want to be another one of your passing dalliances. I was like, oh cool. And then like my my note my note is Bond tries to bed goodnight, but she says goodnight and leaves. And then my immediate next note is, never mind, she immediately recants. And I was like, what the fuck was that? Like and then and then continuing on through that whole thing of she gets literally shoved into a closet so that he can bed another woman in the uh, I was yeah. like this and then and then you know knowing that has zero self respect to be with him at the end of the movie I was just like I like I almost wished that she had turned and joined Scaramanga because of how Bond <laughs> treated her sure, at the end of yeah. the movie. Like that would have been totally justifiable given yes. like the character. But no, everything that happened. And again, yeah, it's not it's not the actress's fault. They nope. just completely don't give a shit about that character, and and yep. she is terribly written in yes. an agonizingly frustrating way. Um, and again, just yes. like that is that is a like that character would not at all fly in today's no. you know like that that is no. there's so much like just bullshit behind that that everybody would be like this is not this is not okay <laughs> like none I mean, of what you've done time, here is okay yeah, her character was so criticized right like it like it is such a like weird decision like what they like if good night isn't my least favorite bond girl character she's certainly in the top three like it, there because there's almost nothing redeeming about that character that they wrote for her to do with right? yeah. like, oh, she is just literally like 
again, like you said earlier, like they're pulling the worst elements from each Bond movie. Almost like they have like the elements from from Russia Love and Doctor No. Like your job is to be pretty, basically, and like not ask questions really. And then they pull like the stuff of like, and you're gonna like chase after him the entire movie, right? And they're gonna like do the like to pull in all the worst elements of Bond girls. Up and yeah, that point for you're gonna character. be you're gonna be incompetent like Rosie Carver from the last yeah. one. We're gonna throw yep. you in the back seat of. We're gonna throw you in a trunk <laughs> for a like a good chunk yeah. of the movie. Yeah, just an entire, like, car chase section, basically. And, like, she's so incompetent, it is insane, right? And, like, you had made the reference last week for Rosie, and then you get to Notes Die, right? And the same character being like, oh, it's my second mission. And, like, the huge gulf there. Here, Goodnight mentions early on, I've been on the job here for, like, two years. And she immediately, the first thing we see of her is her knowing where the green car is from. Mm-hmm. And, like, immediately being like, oh, yeah, well, like, it, I'm good at my job. The right? first thing like, we see of her is, like, cutting off bond as he's trying to go and pursue sure. so like immediately out the gate she is screwing up his his thing um and yeah she redeems herself a little bit by being and like oh no i know like, where all these all where all the green rolls yeah. rices are but yeah it's just yeah. Ugh. it's such a frustrating thing and even like i think anders gets more to do um like she has like an actual arc here uh but even her thing has such weird elements of it too right like i like the idea of like you know this person's mistress wanted him dead because he only loves her when he's about to kill right and like that is like oh there's something interesting in that element right she's not like you know there's no affection towards her really um and her like sending the letter out to bond and like that horror reveal is really cool i mean i think where it goes off the rails immediately is then the thing of like you can have anything you want even me and it's like you don't what is yeah we like went too far here guys yeah I, and i also like the 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 um after scaramanga kills the solar guy gibson mm-hmm. and like we see him basically like doing foreplay with the golden gun to her and holding yeah. that against her lips or what like that's creepy as fuck and threatening yeah. as fuck and so yeah. yeah like i like that totally justifies her wanting him dead because mm-hmm. like putting her in that situation absolutely i think Based on everything else we see of that character, she is not at all, you know, capable of getting the golden bullet with 007, with Scaramanga's fingerprint to like to uh, to to M or whatever. Emma, yeah. Like none of that tracks. Um, but I will say, like, and, and so it's it's like she, like many uh, like characters, unfortunately, also kind of ends up like she just sort of gets fridged um to yeah. to progress but i think like at least it's not just to progress like bond's thing she it she's also fridged to like show exactly what a threat scaramanga is mm-hmm. because my read on the scene is she showed up there to meet bond and he yes. killed her in her seat in a mm-hmm. way that like nobody knew nobody caught yeah. And she yeah. like remains upright and just kind of locked in that position. So let's drop down. Um, yeah. And then he came down and tried to like find the Solex, but obviously it mm-hmm. you know fell out onto the ground or whatever. Um, and he didn't think to look at that, even though the purse is very clearly in a like tipped over position or whatever. Yeah, like there's a whole bunch of that was dumb. But like her being there and and dead just in this crowd of people is the much better version of Bond leaving the girl, the dead body on a chair at that party from whichever movie that was. Was that She's Thunderball? Yeah, tired. that was Thunderball. Yeah. 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 Um, Like, so, so that was another, like, I appreciated that element, but again, I think that's like more about Scaramanga than Anders and seeing that like, she's going to come back as, you know, another infamous character mm-hmm. down the line. I was like, okay, weird, but sure. Yeah, you know, uh, clearly, clearly, the series has not been afraid to like reuse people here and there, no. um, but yeah, it's it like it'll be interesting. And she's much, she's that's a thing too, like to the Britt Eklund thing too, like yeah, Maude Adams. Also, her- I would not have guessed, um, and I've, I found this out like when looking it up in the trivia. I would not have guessed that Britt Eklund was three years older than than Maude Adams. Yeah, um, yeah. When this movie was made, so um, it is. F- like, I will say, again, to the thing of, like, these are poorly written characters, not bad performances. Like, when Maude Adams comes back in Octopussy, as Octopussy, um, I think she gives 
a really good performance and is one of the best parts of that movie, right? Um, she just was given not a lot to work with here. It also always bothers me, um, and I don't know if you really thought about it until now, but like, there's like a weird gap of like her being killed in the sense of we see her go to go back to Scaramanga's place after um, like sleeping with Bond and like recruiting him. And he's like, you're late. It was a double feature. Like, what are you doing? I'm taking my jewelry off. And there's a shot of the Solex, but it doesn't show her take it. It just shows her like the shot of it. And then her clothes are safe. And then we cut to now she's dead. Right. And like, it's not like yeah. a thing of like him seeing her grab it or it's in her voice. And like that. It's just like, oh, there it is for us, the audience. But like, I would have liked a scene of like her stealing it and him catching it or her just like being kind of nervous around him because she seemed largely cool and playing it fine around him. That's why I was like, I want more of a like thing for him to be like, I'm going to murder you for taking this kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, my, my like my read on that was they sleep like they sleep together, go to bed or whatever. She wakes up in the middle of the night, takes it. He wakes up. She's gone, finds that it's missing and then tracks her down. And, and like that's that's and, and yeah, all that happens off screen off, and we don't yeah, we don't yeah. see that. But there have been so many like larger <laughs> leaps in logic that I was like, whatever, sure. I'm, I'm along for it. I, it was definitely like I didn't know that she didn't like that she was there with the Solex or whatever until Bond finds it on the ground. Like I like yeah. it was definitely having to like piece that back together after mm-hmm. seeing how everything is played out. Um, yeah. But like so much of that, especially just the the jumps they make in a lot of these early movies. I'm like, whatever, it's uh, fine. Yeah, yeah, I'd probably have another like a one or two more connecting connect the dots yeah. sequences if made today. Um, yeah whatever they've they've done weirder things um that um, did remind me one of the other um one of the other things i want to highlight as like a, oh that was a cool thing um was the uh the queen elizabeth like being the secret headquarters for yeah like it's rad for, uh, like that like that got introduced as they're like taking the boat right in and i'm like i like it was another thing i took a note of like if they don't like come back to that in some way, that is going to be such a weird tangent to have like introduced of like, here's a yeah. wreck that was, you know, this giant wreck, blah, blah, blah. blah. Happened and, three years ago. And yeah. so when they, when like Bond gets like it taken there slash like thinks he is like escapes there or whatever. And, and like it, and you go in there, it was just like a really cool set design of like, yeah. okay, yeah, this is, it is that like, okay. Poseidon Adventure or Uncharted Three. It is like okay, how does this how does this now feel because everything is on a you know on a tilt or whatever? How has this organization made this work? Um, and I love like yeah the the ramps on the walkways or whatever or or I guess it wasn't even a ramp. It was like they created you know like because you see it like in a in a slight glimpse you see like the the original stairs uh, and then they kind of created like you know, stairs that now fit the cur- the current orientation of the thing, like mm-hmm. on top of those other stairs so that like when you're walking down this hallway, it's a natural thing and you're not like at a weird slant the whole time or the bar or like the, the little, yeah, the little like office that, that M and Q are in. Um, like it was, it was a really cool set design. Um, yeah. uh, and I, I very much appreciate that. I, I'm guessing Ken Adams is still doing all this stuff. Um, <laughs> I also appreciated that like right up the top, we're in the weird, like crazy layer, uh, the crazy yeah. villain layer. Yeah. Um, again, the, the fun house is like a really fun design. It's a great one. Weird in that, like some of the, the like dummies are very clearly actually actors, um, mm-hmm. and not wax dummies shaking. Yeah. Um, uh, so like it was, it was odd in that regard, but it was like, whatever. Um, and, and it's, it's definitely a, I don't have the full understanding of like the layout of that thing. Um, Mm -hmm. but even so, like I had enough of an understanding so that I could appreciate when Bond is clearly in scaffolding that he is like gone off set. And, and then, you know, we have all the stuff where Nick Nack can't find him and all that stuff. And, and he like, it's it's absurd that he's able to do a quick change into the outfit that du- that the dummy yes. was wearing, um, mm-hmm. but I like so I am like I wish that he had just been in that same attire or something like that or mm-hmm. or something close to it so that it was more believable because I love that being the way he outsmarts Scaramanga, 
Um, and and we, the audience, get enough of a glimpse of we see the hand with the full fingers to know yeah. that it's really him. And Scaramanga just kind of overlooks that detail, I guess. Um, so, like, ultimately, like, I, I appreciated that despite how stupid and unbelievable it was. Um, yes. So, but yeah, like a, another, you know, great yes. set design in a lot of elements of this this movie. Yeah, I wanted to give a shout out. Uh, this is not a Ken Adams okay. production design, actually. It is a Peter Merton one. Um, I want to give him a shout out because it is a great, I think, uh, design all across film, like you said, both in the Fun House and also on the Queen Elizabeth. Um, I The Fun House one is always so interesting to me because... Again, I feel like so much of this movie can be expanded. Like, I just wish we had more scenes for some things and significantly fewer for others. But, like, I wish we'd had, like, one more scene from, like, Bond in the scaffolding to Bond in the suit for the only reason be, Or we were just, like, him seeing it and, like, us making that connection because it really does just cut from, like, him climbing the scaffolding to then, boom, now he's in the suit and shoots him. And, like, it is a hell of a jump. Like, we don't see him climb over to a new thing, see that walk over change anything like that and so the way that it's cut and edited makes it happen makes it seem like scaramanga is like walking in like normal time and so bond and our mind or see this in mind when i watch it should be too but in reality they're like working like two different timelines essentially Mm -hmm. and it makes it confusing for me in that aspect um but it is a great payoff right and i love the idea of like planting that seed literally at the very beginning of the movie of like bond has three fingers missing that's going to come into play later on at the end of the thing it's like such a cool um little like seed that's implanted there i think for me in terms of highlights i like the fact that q is not just in the movie but in it multiple times Mm -hmm. they very much responded like oh people didn't like that we're gonna give him still doesn't really work with have anything to do with gadgets this time around no (laughs) No gadgets. He is Again, just the like Q-Lab section. He, he is he is an analyst, um, yeah, and and basically. knows a lot of, or can can identify a lot about a a, a golden bullet. Which I like. I, I I this was another note I had. Obviously, they weren't going to make this reference or anything like that. But I, I made a joke about the about Q and the analyst very politely declining to note all of the fecal matter that is also mm-hmm. on this bullet, mm-hmm. um, because obviously mm-hmm. it has gone through uh, through Bond's 007. system. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, yeah, like that. Was, all of that stuff was really fucking stupid. Like the whole belly yeah. dancer sequence in the beginning. That was yep. like, I was like, okay, that's just dumb. Um, yeah. And and what a nonchalant thing for this woman to have seen the man she was sleeping with shot straight through the neck and then she just takes that bullet and turns it into a belly piercing yep like what the hell is wrong with you (laughs) for good luck and i don't know about you trevor but i think getting shot through the neck yeah um is not great luck for someone um that could just be me i am you know i'm an outlier out here but like that to me seems like an omen of the opposite of good luck in fact yeah um, um and then yeah the scene of like bond swallowing it like i hate it and like how like dumb comic-y that is played for yeah um, uh, to the to the yeah. airport no to a pharmacy or whatever yeah it's like yeah. okay ha 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 yeah um, um i the uh, back yeah. to bond also being an asshole in this i i appreciate it or i enjoyed like the lazar scene you know as brief as yeah. that was with bond yeah like interrogating him with his own weapon that he has made kind of like like okay cool yeah You're this, right, is, this is very okay, much yeah. like sean connery asshole bond more than like the roger moore bond that we got last week but mm-hmm. um yeah it, like i and thought that was like, like, an interesting scene and it was like i i'm like i'm there was a lot of it where i was like i'm fascinated by the lazar character i just want to mm-hmm. see more with him like i wanted him to yeah. like come back as like a and i don't think he's going to um, No, he never will yeah uh it was like Oh, like if they need like a weapons expert or something like that, they could go to him in the future. But no, they're not going to do that. I think that. Yeah, I I think that it's unfortunate, right? Like, I think Roger Moore is playing such a not like just an asshole, basically. And I mean, you mentioned like Sean Connery, and I think we have slightly different views of Connery's bond. But like, to me, it's like the worst elements of that bond. Um Right, like it is like the Thunderball version where he's like just a little bit too much of an asshole and not like charming at all. Mm-hmm. And then I think I find it particularly bad because like Sean Connery, I think can 
work with that a bit more versus Rajmore, I think it's particularly kind of like, oh, this is just not you. You're just not a good asshole because it doesn't suit you. Like you don't doesn't suit you and what your look and vibe is at all. Yeah, and so it's like particularly jarring. Um, especially like the break the hand, like I'll break your arm kind of thing, and like smacking her, and it's like, oh, this yeah, this is very yeah, uh, not you. Um, and like that to me is like so much of this movie right like you might have had my favorite you know one sentence of blurb of the film of just like they pulled all the worst elements from the prior bond films in it and i think you notice it immediately right like pretty much from the jump it starts it just doesn't feel right it doesn't feel like it's vibing at all right like i had like you know watch movie the mental note of just like man this is not it this is just not good it doesn't have any sort of like fun fluid motion to it right because even diamonds are forever for its many many faults at least moves at a pretty good pace i think right like guy hamilton films are pretty quick i think and pretty kind of have this like lightness to them and this fast-paced nature to them that kind of keeps you on the edge of your seat and keeps you engaged even if it's not a great movie like diamonds was and this move is so slow it's so plot and i feel like it's like nothing is happening and we're still taking our time with it um like high fat is a character that gets introduced just to be killed basically like there's no point to having him be a thing the reason scaring kills him is are, are sort of like unnecessary um like so many decisions are weird and baffling uh the fact that scaramanga has a flying car is just sort of like not talked about ever again but like it's like <laughs> yeah. a weird thing too i mean the 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 high i mean like again going off of like this is an amalgamation of other movies high fat is effectively the asado character from you only live sure. twice yeah that's like a great it's way to it's just I mean, given less time he, he is yeah. Like it, it, he is he is the head of the company that builds the the lair kind of thing and, and builds the like the solar plant um, that is in uh, Scaramanga's lair. Um, but yeah, like Scaramanga kills him and then just immediately mm -hmm. like hostile takeover, <laughs> I guess. Sure. That's yeah. that's exactly how that works. Yep. Yeah, sure. Um, But I think we'll move to villain's corner here. I, well, like we, um, so what I. I we didn't like we talked around him a lot, I think. Uh what are your thoughts on the knickknackness of this movie? Okay. Yeah, that's a great question. I think I've always been super conflicted by him, right? Like I've always sort of been like, I don't know if this is great or not, right? Like both in terms of like, I don't know if your character is great, and also in terms of like, I don't know if this is problematic. Like he's just such a weird character. And like I find parts of him really funny and like i think they work well um i like i like the image of him just behind bond with a gun um like i think it's a cool moment i like him working both for and against scare manga in the duels like i think that's really cool especially in the beginning like i really loved that aspect of his character and would have liked to have seen more of that fleshed out this kind of dual loyalty to both Scaramanga and himself in terms of being like, oh, if he dies, I get everything. If he wins, you know, I get to stay here too and kind of help sharpen his skills kind of thing. Um, and like Scaramanga knowing that and like I liked their relationship a lot. Um, even though weirdly enough, we don't get a lot of like one-on-one -on -one scenes with the two of them. It's a lot of like Scaramanga doing stuff or Nick knack doing things. Not a lot of them like synced together. Like even in the island, um so like that is sort of a thing i wish i could have seen more of um i think everything and we agree on this and like the end end of the movie is bad yeah um it's just truly not good and it's such a weird end and again pulling the worst from like prior bomb movies like the bomb movies that end with like here's like the post credit stinger almost kind of think of like the big bad villain's been killed here's like the last henchman coming to take him off and like i think those moments kind of vary in success like i think it works in goldfinger um and even i think it works in like on her message good service right we're like blowfield and bunt coming back um and diamonds are forever with Winton kid i think those are all great i like it less than like from russia with love or live and let die personally um and i think this kind of pulled more from those which is like all right like here's like this random fight that you can't really have be a fight because of the size disadvantage so you have to do this different kind of thing and like it immediately felt weird and didn't feel right at all and was played for laughs, but the laughs weren't good laughs. And yeah, it's just, it's just not a good ending at all. Yeah. I was, uh, I was going to say like, I, 
I have a similar, like, I was torn. And there were, like, for most of the movie, like, him being a little person is not a, a facet of, like, who he is as a character. He is a butler. He is a servant. Mm-hmm. Um, but he's doing everything that, like, a, you know, full-sized adult would do or anything. Like, there's nothing about him being a little person that is, like, inherently you know innate to the character or anything yeah um it it becomes a little problematic when like there's all the m word kind of like being thrown around mm. in the in the middle chunk of the movie um sure. but like again that was the time and that was yeah. probably not as you know not as as derogatory a term and whatnot yeah. but then the final sequence is what like flips it to the nope this just doesn't work this like mm. he was cast to do all of this bullshit at the end um mm. and and in a in a frustrating way it was like i obviously just because of like societal context i know him i know him as tattoo from fantasy island um mm. but like looking in and realizing that fantasy island is going to happen three years from now. Um, yeah. So this, you know, he, this is his big break effectively. And then fantasy Island comes along and, kind of makes him a household name that's playing the plane um you know uh, aspect um I, like so it, it's it's almost like the the same element of like last week of like oh it's cool that they like cast you know a person in that role mm-hmm. um i mean obviously he is also going to very much become like the you know the form or the the template for many me years and years down the line obviously yeah um but uh, like so for like 80% of the movie, I was like cool with him. Um, and then there's like, there's, there's how the characters talk about him. Um, and it's, it's not even like Scaramanga almost sees him as like, you know, an equal, obviously yeah. like he works for Scaramanga or whatever, but like he doesn't see his stature as like no. a thing that makes him less effective or less efficient. If anything, like he sees it as an advantage in that. Yeah. He can like people overlook him. And and you which know, I think it, ties into Scaramanga Circus performing back exactly too, of like yeah. being looked down on from that too yeah. yeah um but then yeah the the whole the like this was the one thing I kind of put out there in our Slack uh you yeah. know beforehand was like wow that has like got to be the dumbest ending of these movies that we've had yeah. of the whole you know fight just like knickknack throwing bottle after bottle after bottle after bond and him like whacking them away with like parts of a chair shout out to like how efficient he was with that aim of like hitting those bottles but like the the end piece of him literally throwing knickknack in a suitcase and then taking him out apparently to string him up in a crow's nest uh was just like nope didn't need any of that you could have found yeah. any better way to like write that character Dispatch, out yeah. um uh, than this and so yeah that that immediately like brought the like i was like okay yep nope they for for a good chunk of this movie i thought they were handling him very well and very like respectfully mm-hmm. and then they just threw it away at the end i guess there's also that bit where he's like pretending to be a statue which mm. like worked to his advantage um and and he like he he basically almost kills bond with a trident before yeah. scaramanga is like or before high fat is like no not here um take him to school well, which yeah. was another yeah like take him to school so bond wakes up surrounded by women having been having the last two things that happened to him in his mind are he was being like almost killed by a pair of sumo wrestlers and then was knocked out by an unknown assailant from behind. Yeah. And he wakes yeah. up and thinks everything's fine and, and like is he's in heaven, his punch. Yeah. yeah. And then like yeah. watches this. I will say I did appreciate the, and again, this is like uh, effectively a proto Indiana Jones moment yeah, of, absolutely is. Uh, yeah, of him just like this. kicking the guy in the face and then yeah. like bowing and <laughs> being ready to be done with it. Um, uh, but yeah, it was like, it was just so many bad elements to this movie that I'm just like, ah, nope, <laughs> this, this yeah, wasn't I talked, it. Yeah. I talked last week too about the fact that like the Roger Moore movies, I think are particularly egregious in seeing what was really popular at the time and like putting that in the movie. Yeah. And in Man with the Gold Gun, it very much is like, oh, you know, it's really popular right now. Kung Fu movies. Let's have a whole just random karate Kung Fu section in the film for no real reason, just because it's what's happening right now, right? And it goes about as good as you think it would. 
Um, like the nieces fight and everyone is like the best part of that for sure. Um, and I do like the image of like Bond, you know, almost punching the last guy and then just like pushing him over is like funny, but yeah, it just doesn't work. And that sort of describes even that, like so much of he movie. does that. And then he goes across the bridge and that guy like comes back up, chases him and then Bond all like gives him another finishing thing and yeah, throws him over the bridge over, into yeah. the water. It's like, what, like, what was the point of that? Like, why did you? For last. Why did you need to give this guy like two finishing blows? Kind of mm-hmm. like whatever. That was really dumb. Yeah. Um, Trevor, where do you rank Francisco Scaramanga in our villains' corner list? I mean, again, I really liked him. I just wish yeah. he was in a better movie. Um, yeah. and I even like. I mean, like, there's another element. Like, we don't. We didn't really get into it, but like, I. There was an element of like I really appreciated this that like the under you know lying plot was around this like solar energy that you know can mm-hmm. can do wonders and whatnot and until he also turned it into a death laser it was like an interesting mm-hmm. oh he yeah. he doesn't want to take over the world he just wants to make a lot of money off of this and so he's yeah. created this like solar plant that people Sell can like franchise sheiks, and whatever yeah, like and yeah. and yeah the idea of like oh the oil sheiks will like pay to keep this keep solar off the market very prescient obviously yeah. uh given uh you know how how lobbying has kind of kept solar energy down for many many years yeah. um uh so like i like i i the, even that was like an undercurrent of the movie that i appreciated um that just goes off the wall when it's like oh also i turned that like i was able to harness that power into a death ray <laughs> uh and let's blow up your plane um but like I yeah, I mean like I I almost I almost want to put him above Blowfield 2.0, just in terms of like Scaramanga himself mm. is mm. is mm. such an engaging foil and threat you and presence what? to Bond that like I and, and Christopher Lee is great as him. Um mm-hmm. that like that's that's like I I mean he definitely goes above Red Grant for me just because like he has, I think more of a presence than Red Grant does. He's Red Grant is like a, yeah. a threat throughout a lot of the movie, but yeah. like doesn't re- like he has like one scene with Bond, whereas like um, uh, Scaramanga has a few great scenes with Bond in the in the fight over the dinner scene as he's like giving the tour through his facility. Um, uh, and so yeah, like he doesn't he doesn't surpass Goldfinger, um, but I think he he's more memorable to me than. Than Blofeld 2.0 was as great as Telly Savalas' performance was. Yeah. A lot of that was a couple scenes with a lackluster Bond. So like he didn't yeah. have like this is like a good like head to head kind of rivalry. Yeah. Also the 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 duel that he kind of like just <laughs> ducks yeah. out on, skips out on. Um, uh, was was a fun sequence. But yeah, he, do, he doesn't he doesn't surpass Goldfinger for me. But yeah, I think I would put him above Blofeld 2.0. In my ranking. So I'm really glad that you like Scaramanga because he is actually one of my favorite villains in the series for a lot of the reasons you've talked about, right? And whenever I would talk about, you know, Man with the Golden Gun is bad, but it's fun, I pretty much am always referring exclusively to his character because I think he is giving the movie so much of its life uh, and energy and like driving force. Yeah, I love Scaramanga. Um, I'm totally happy to have him second on this list. That's sort of where I was looking at putting him too, so I'm glad we agree on that. Um, I think he is a fantastic villain. I could not have said it better myself that I wish he was in a better movie um, because he is so good. He's such a good Bond villain, and I think him and Roger Moore, when they're together, are my favorite moments of Roger Moore in this movie because otherwise I don't really like his performance that much, Mm -hmm. and I think Chris really gets so much out of uh, Roger Moore. Um, I think both the last and opening kind of acts the movie with him and the first duel at the beginning and the last one with more are great. I think the scene of him at like the kickboxing match together as he kind of narrates his life story is really sad and really like well done by Chris Lee. Um, and talking about how like, you know, it was one of the hardest kills and the easiest to kill like Andre Anders uh, is all just like really good stuff. Like he is a great actor given a great performance in a really bad movie and uh, saddled with a third nipple and saddled with a third. Yeah, it's weird. Um, but yeah, Scaramanga will be our second placed villain here. Then 
Um, I didn't go over it last week, I think, so I'll kind of run through it now. Uh, we've got Goldfinger in first still, Scaramanga in second, Blowfield 2.0 uh, in third, Red Grant in fourth, Kananga slash Mr. Big in fifth, Odd Job is six, Blowfield 1.0, then Blowfield 3.0. And then the bottom three is Emilio Largo, Rosa Club, and Dr. No um, to kind of round out the Villains Corner ranking. Um, again, QLab, we already kind of talked, touching it, but like literally no gadgets for Bond in this movie. Um, I, I will say like no, no gadgets for Bond, but the like attachment to the car that turned it into a plane as clearly faked as that was, mm-hmm. was like a fun idea. Yeah. Uh, it's a really cool behind the scenes thing, right? Because they filmed, they actually filmed it with like the shit on it on the runway, like going down, and then they cut to basically a model they made that were flying in the air. Um, it's actually a really cool, like element of the like making of part of the film and like behind the scenes production elements of that mm-hmm. um, that I almost included in the trivia. Uh, so then going on from there, Trevor, those music moments. Uh, I, where would you sorry, rank the music? One from? other thing that we have to talk about that oh. I that I completely I like I just thought of was like, oh my god, that was another really stupid thing that happened in this movie. Um, the fact that Goodnight turns the laser beam on with her butt, yeah, uh, and and can't figure out how to hit an off switch or any of that stuff, and Bond just gets saved by a miraculously timed cloud. Cloud. Um. Yeah. I was just like, and then almost not saved. And then by yeah, and then almost uh, killed by the disappearance time, yeah. of that cloud because, yeah. uh, yeah. That, God, that was such a when, such a dumb thing. <laughs> when that sequence happened, and I was watching it this most recent time, <laughs> I I had two big thoughts. One again was just like, this is a movie that should have ended with Scary Manga and Bond's duel, like. Everything after that, I didn't need. Like, every part of that movie after, we're just like, I don't need any of this extra, like, 15 minutes. None of it really works. None of it's really particularly great. Um, and then that scene in particular is just like, again, they just wanted her in a bikini. Here's a close-up shot of her butt for, like, 30 seconds. Yeah. And now she's just utterly incompetent. And Bond, you know, has to, like, figure it out. And the fact that it's, like, clouds is dumb. Like, they, like... They could have had it be a number of things that would turn the laser on or off. Oh, the building's blowing up. It like came on by accident kind of thing. Um, and then she like smashed the button to stop it. But like they just wanted to make her seem dumb and make it like a weird element of luck that he gets out, I guess. I don't it's just yeah, none of it that is great. Yeah. Uh the entire ending sequence. It's, um, uh, yeah, that was uh, we we didn't really do I don't think we had it in the dock this time around, but like the the things that definitely don't hold up, it was like obviously mm. the the yeah. knickknack stuff, the um, all of the you know like Eastern Asian racism um, throughout J.W. Pepper can fuck off a hill and die forever. The, the, um, <laughs> it's insane what he got away with. Like it's insane what they like let him just say in this movie. Yeah, um, it is bonkers. Uh, and then um, the 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 uh, just again just the terribly terribly written for both of the female leads i would say in this yes. um yeah. uh, but especially like good night Very especially nice, at yeah. the end the just obligatory like yeah she just shows up and is in a bikini for the rest of this movie um, which again pulled from the Russian bomb movies yep. is just straight up for jill st john's yep. character tiffany case and diamonds are forever yep it's just that same plot device yep so it is not very good at all. Uh, Trevor, how did you like the music of The Man with the Golden Gun? Oh, I mean, this was, I think, one of the most forgettable ones I've we've had. <laughs> had. I, I think I even took, like, I, I took that note of just, like, this is a, like, it's, because it's so specific to, like, she's just singing the plot of the movie, basically. Yeah, yeah um, absolutely. And I was just like, this just isn't good. Uh, what did I, uh, da, 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 da. I think it's below on Her Majesty's Secret Service yeah, for me. Yeah, my I, I wrote uh, my my back to back notes here were uh, titular Golden Gun looks like shit, and then utterly forgettable mm-hmm. song. I will I do want to give a shout out though to uh, Bond's line, "Who would pay to have me killed?" and then M without missing a beat. Jealous husbands, outraged chefs, humiliated tellers, which like yeah. jealous husbands, I absolutely get, and especially like the people Bond fucks around with would absolutely have a million dollars to like pay for a hit. Yeah, but like. M is drastically overestimating the money that chefs or tailors make. Um, and sure. also, what the fuck did Bond do to those chefs or tailors? 
The tailors I get because like he's destroying the suits, right? I've never understood the chef one though because I've never seen him like complain about food really. But it's, it, it led to a great like it, uh, line from him. Yeah, if anything, it's it like for me, I would chalk it up with like Bond is like incredibly pretentious with knowing like the mm. the years of sure. like wines and Wine, vintages yeah. and shit like that. So he probably he probably pissed some chef off <laughs> at some point with sure. that kind of nonsense. But uh, yeah, it was it was yeah, like a, like like it could have just been jealous husbands and and you Period. and you could have had like a all right, fair enough. <laughs> um yeah, Roger Moore's Bond in particular is I think sort of infamous for being like the most pretentious of the bonds. Um, I mean, yeah, like he, Connery yeah. had a lot of those things, uh, a sure. lot like so much, like some, some of the things he like talks about the vintage of aren't even things that have vintages. He's like, Oh, I meant, I meant the vintage the years, of the, the yeah. year, the grapes were whatever. It's like, Oh, shut the fuck up. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, I agree. The music is forgettable, um, mostly. I do like the chorus of it. Um, I think the Mammoth the Golden Gun chorus is catchy, but otherwise, I couldn't tell you. Because I've been, like, humming it since yesterday, but I've just been humming the same chorus over and over and over again, and I can't think of another word in it. Yeah, it is utterly forgettable otherwise. Um, so we will put it above Thunderball, below On Her Majesty's Secret Service, uh, which is only so low because its main title isn't even in the opening credits, which is Bananas. Um... Which leads us, Trevor, to final ranking and review of the man with the golden gun. Um, final thoughts. I mean, I, it's like part of this is I as as I'm watching more of these, like my I think early on I I was kind of grading these on a curve of like oh of the era stuff like that. And so I probably graded Thunderball higher, but I give this a D plus. <laughs> uh, like mm-hmm. it is like, and that is all thanks to Christopher Lee. Um, mm-hmm. Otherwise, mm-hmm. like this would just be a, a straight up easy F um, for a lot of this. But yeah. again, in my overall like ranking of things, I would rather watch this again for the Christopher Lee-ness of it. Um, then I would then, then Thunderball. So it still, it still comes up over Thunderball on my overall rankings. It's um, crazy to me. Uh, but like, it's, Fair it's, enough. it is the, in the same way that like diamonds are forever was like so bad. It was funny. Like there are elements of this that are so bad they are funny, and I will at least get a chuckle out of them again. Mm. And then I will hate the JW Pepper sequence, but not as much as I hated all of the last third of Thunderball. <laughs> Thunderball. Yeah, for me, I was just pr- quickly looking at like the review score and metric we have for that new site itself, right? And I was like, yeah, I mean, I think this movie's like a five, right? I think it's a D, a five, whatever you want to call it, or I guess that's an F, but I'm being a bit generous in that. Like, I think it is mediocre, that mediocre movie. Um, like, I think it's totally that. It veers into like a four to 10 territory. I'm just being straight up being bad. Um, like, it is not a good movie. It does not work on really any level, I think, except for Chris Riley, um, who gives so much fun to it. And then Nick Knack has like a few moments. Um, I like the fact that we get more of Q in it. I like that. I like that he gets more to do and it's kind of gets to be like, almost like a detective-y kind of like analyst kind of figure, um, which in some ways foreshadows what Q will be in like the modern era. Uh, but yeah, I mean, there are no gadgets. The music is fine. Um, the villain's good, but Bond is not great, right? I think they just don't get his character right. I think the Bond girls are bad, um, if not some of just the outright worst. I think it has huge issues with like racism in the movie, misogyny. Um, it it is just all over the place tonally. It's slow and plodding. Um, like it basically had the opposite reaction I felt to watching *Live and Let Die*. Where *Live and Let Die*, like twenty minutes in, I was like, "Oh, this movie's fantastic! It's gonna be my second favorite." Like it's just so much fun, and I loved it and had a great time with it. Or obviously watching *Goldfinger* itself, which I was just you know, I fell in love with like a new, basically these, you know, past few viewings here. This is the opposite where like I, 20 minutes in, I was like, this movie's going to be bad. It's going to be my least favorite one. It's not going to have anything fun. Cause in my ranking again, diamonds are forever is last and diamonds are forever. At least is not a good movie. Let's be clear, but it is fun. Right. And you know, is that because you watch it together and could have like a Rocky horror picture show kind of viewing of it? Sure. And also Charles Gray 
is in Rocky Horror Picture Show. And I don't know if I <laughs> talked about that on that week's episode, but he's in that movie and it's great. He's like the narrator. Um, and, you know, it has this campiness to it that makes it not great, but makes parts of it entertaining and fun, especially with Charles Gray's Blofeld or Mr. Went and Mr. Kid. This has like none of that, right? Because even Scaramanga, who is great, it's not like, He's not fun in that same way, right? He's like a very like well done, serious kind of character. Um, so yeah, for me, Man with the Golden Gun is definitely last. Um, I think it is just it does not work. It is gonna be in the running for being one of my least favorite Bond movies. Um, it is one of the only ones I think is just like outright not good and bad. Um, and I still have Thunderball. Um, what that's fifth? One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, fifth on my list. Um, although again, as I've said before, you could really break my rankings so far into like three different categories of like great for Goldfinger, Live and Let Die, and From Russia with Love, and then four movies I think are good but flawed, right? Um, and then two that I think are bad. Um, and pretty much all four of those movies in the middle part of my ranking for You Live Twice, On Her Majesty's Secret Service, Thunderbond, Doc No literally weekly i am debating the order of those movies so we're like i'm constantly like i'm too hard on that or too hard on that i'm like no like honor my chicken service is not that great or it is greater i don't know so we'll see where it actually checks out at the end but for right now um yeah man with the golden gun is definitely last on my list um so that takes us to the outros um if you like what you heard for this um more downbeat episode of that bond show you should go over to youtube.com slash that in your site where you should already be for this YouTube exclusive show and hit the subscribe button, like the video, leave a comment, tell us your thoughts. If we're crazy for being so down on the man with the golden gun, we aren't. Um, and hit the little bell notification to get notified when a new video goes live over there. Otherwise, you can go over to thatnerdysite.com and check out all the latest reviews, features, rankings, um, that are going live over there, including all of our, you know, game of the year pieces going live um, as we speak. Um, they will all definitely be out by the time you listen to this week's episode. Um, and then you can go find Trevor Starkey at Trevor J. Starkey on the internet. Trevor, anything that you want to plug or shout out? Uh, I will go ahead and plug uh, our weekly Let's Plays that go live uh, uh, every Tuesday and Thursday uh, on on the YouTube, uh, as well as a series that will definitely still be going on by the time this episode goes live. Um, uh, Friday Night Dying Light, where Cameron Abbott is uh, every Friday night we're uploading an episode of Cameron Abbott playing through Dying Light 2 and for some reason he was like i'm going to make it friday night lights themed uh mm-hmm. and in so much as he bought a few pieces of merch uh friday night lights themed and says uh clear eyes full hearts can't lose uh a lot um uh and and that's about as far as the crossover goes but uh you can go check that out on on youtube.com/thatnerdysite as well if you want to catch cameron playing through dying light 2 uh, you can go find me at Lefty Logi at Lefty Logi on the internet, L-O-G-G-Y, whichever you prefer. Um, yeah, I'll echo that shout out. Uh, I'm very excited for Cameron going through Dying Light 2, just in general. Um, but especially with the Friday Night Lights theme being so strange and bizarre. Cameron's Let's Plays are always fun because it's just a matter of like how quickly do they get unhinged and it's a great watch. Um, so go check all of that out over there. Also go check out all of our finished Game of the Year content. Because uh, by the time you listen to this, it will all be out. Um, as of recording, we've already got half of the sites out, I think. Um, so go check all of that good stuff over there. Um, otherwise, you can go find that nerdy site at that nerdy site all across the internet. For myself, for Trevor, for all of us here at That Bond Show, we will return with The Spy Who Loved Me. <laughs>